So what is it that makes an alkene an alkene? A what? Say it with some conviction. Double bond. Double bond. And so, yes, finally, something that's not wishy-washy. Faith integration. What's, what does God say about being lukewarm and all wishy-washy? You, you know, spit you out of your mouth. But not out of your mouth, out of his mouth, so. Same thing. That's why I just thought I always said it. I always hate it. I just wanted to shake you. And so... <laughs> Not physically, because that would be that would be crossing a boundary. <laughs> okay. <laughs> All right. So first off, we just need to know how to name them and to draw them or recognize them. It's really really simple. Um, so we just ought to do some examples. So are just a couple examples. I'll give you a moment to... Okay, so for the top one, what would the name of this one be? Cyclo. And then there are how many carbons in it? Lukewarm people. Six. Six, thank you. So that makes it hex. I'm going to accidentally spit out my cough drop. I already spit enough on this, on this iPad. Like, it's... If you feel my iPad or computer, it feels like it's in Braille already anyway. <laughs> I don't know the coughing and spitting that I do. All right, so then what's the ending for an alkene? Ene. So this becomes cyclohexene. Okay. Now, this one, we do not need to do a number on it because by default, there's only one thing on there. If you put down one cyclohexene, it's fine. I won't count it wrong. But you don't need the number because there's only one... One thing on there. Okay. And so, but if we look at this next one, first of all, what's going to be the root on it? So, there's still going to be a cyclohexene. But it's going to be a hexanol. Okay. So, what's the ending? The ending is all. This is one time when you've got to put the space in. Okay? And so, because then we have an issue. And then not only that, but we have a function you're paying off of that, right? We have, what's this one right here? It's good old methyl. And so, oh, whoops. So that's methyl. Okay? So now, and, and technically there are two ways to write this one, so I'll go ahead and write it this way too. Methyl cyclo hex space in space O. Now we just have to put the numbers in, the locants in. So what gets top priority? The alcohol. So that means the alcohol is number one. Okay. So what will be the locant for the double bond. Two. And so in the way that I have it numbered up there, you can put the two there. Or you can put the two directly before the EN. That's why I wanted to show you both ways. And then finally, we have the methyl group. And the methyl is going to be what number? Three. <clears throat> so this is three methyl, two cyclohexene, one all. Or you could also say three methyl, cyclohex, two ene, one all. And if we do just another example real quick. I'm trying, to, I'm trying to make sure that I come up with almost every possible scenario that I can. Okay, there we go. So, 
So how many carbons are in the longest carbon containing chain that has a double bond? There are nine, and so the roots for it would be non or known. So we have, oops, wrong one I've been using. Okay, and the ending will be in. Leave a space, I'm gonna cut off. Leave a space for the double bond. Then we have, and for the low camp for the double bond, I should say. Then we have two functional groups. We have this one, which that one would be methyl, and this one would be fluoro. Which one comes last in the alphabetical order? Methyl, so it's gonna be closest to the word nonine. So I'm gonna put it, and fortunately I, <laughs> it's gonna go over my F for the fluorine, because I'm not very good. And then we have the fluoro. So now we just have to put in the locants. So what gets top priority? The fluorine and the methyl or the alkene? Does anyone know? It's the alkene. Okay, alkenes take priority over halogens and alkyl groups like methyl groups or ethyl groups or propyl groups because you can think of it as, as increasing number of carbon to carbon bonds. But they don't take priority over anything that has an oxygen. Okay, so alcohols, aldehydes, ketones, carboxylic acids, esters, anything like that, which we'll find out about later on. So knowing that, what will be the locant for the double bond in this one? Four. Four. And the methyl group would be? Seven, one, two, three, four, five, six, seven yes. I didn't, and then eight for fluoro. Okay. That's why I wanted just to try to come up with as many possibilities here as, as I could. <clears throat> okay. Um, no. Oh, this is the common names, just in case you come in and cross them in your quizzes or something like that. Um, which I want you to know, ethylene makes, makes sense. That's the one that you need to know. That's the real name. But the common name for it is ethylene and propylene versus propene. Uh, anytime you get more than that, you always have to put the locant on, like 1-butene versus 2-butene, <clears throat> so on and so forth. Okay. We already talked about that, how alcohols take priority. Then there are other common names that... <laughs> I just want to point out, and one's called vinyl versus allyl, and then there's isoprenol, or iso, I'm sorry, isopropanol. Um, but I just want to point a vinyl group means that it's double, the double bond's directly attached. The allylic one means there's one linking carbon. Okay, and I just point that out because hopefully by the end of the semester we'll start talking about allylic systems. Which is just when it goes double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond. Because they have special properties. And what we'll find out by the end of this chapter, the beginning of the next one, is it does matter if something's directly attached to this carbon. If it's directly attached, it's called the, it's called the vanillic port, part. Versus if it's one carbon removed, and it's called allylic. Okay, but this is, and vinyl does come from that whole, you know, historical root for that. A little means there's one linking carbon. Mm -hmm. So here, let me just go back just to draw. So for example, oh, whoops, <laughs> that, that did not come out right. You can undo it. Um, okay, there, for example. This right here would be an allylic group because see, there's a, the double bonds and then there's one linking carbon to it. Versus if the two double bonds have been directly attached, it would say it's vinyl. <coughs> you always number cycloalkenes to where it, they're in contiguous order, always between carbons one and two or from lower number to higher number. Okay, and that's really important that they're showing in this instance right here. For example, it's not one chloro, it's gonna be three chlorocycloheptene. Okay. And, or you, you wouldn't even say, you know, uh, two or whatever, because 
this, well, first of all, this gets priority, and secondly, it always has to be between one and two. It can't be between one and two this direction, because otherwise that would make the chlorine too high. All right. Uh, structure and bonding, I'm gonna go really fast. I mean, because we actually already covered this. This is really just a review. The fact that all of them are sp2 hybridized. Right. And it has a sigma bond and one pi bond, and we drew that out earlier. This is the pi pi overlapping, like the dumbbells, how they kind of overlap. <coughs> okay. We also talked about the fact that what's the angle between here and here? What is that angle? Roughly, it's one twenty, mm -hmm. and twenty degrees. Because it's a trigonal planar. I um, can't really think of anything else that we hadn't already discussed from before. Um, all right. Okay, but this is where I wanted to get to. I'm just once again talking about SP3 versus SP2 hybridization. hybridization. All right, now we're getting to isomers. So we can imagine here... That is a really bad job. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. One, two, three, four. Okay, all of these are butenes. But they're not all created equal. <clears throat> Okay. <clears throat> so we can name these. So if we name this one that's on the left, obviously it's butene. But what's missing? How can we tell it from the other two butenes? It's locant. What's locant on it? One. It's one. Okay. So if we go to the middle one, What's the locant on it? Two. two butene. What about the one on the right hand side? What would it be? What's it locant? What's its locant? What's its locant? Locant. Its number. Two. It's also two butene. But you're going to find out that they actually do have different properties. Okay, between these two, so we have to be able to differentiate between these two, right? So, whenever you've got Let's see how you're going to say this. Put these in relatively simple terms. Whenever you only have two groups that are not hydrogens hanging off, that are on opposite sides. I should say opposite sides. But see here we have a hydrogen, we have a methyl, hydrogen and a methyl. When they're going on opposite directions like this, it's called trans. So that becomes trans meaning opposite, trans to butene, when the two larger groups are going on the same side, it's called cis. Right? So that's like trans and cis, and that is related to trans fats. Okay, which, what are trans fats? What are they in your diet? Good, bad, ugly? Bad, they're very bad. In fact, some places even went through and, you know, out prohibited them even in the diet. Because it used to be, does anyone know, where do trans, are trans fats naturally occurring? No, not really. And so when you take, if you take biochemistry, you're going to find out about two, two times that you have trans fats that are naturally occurring, but they're never released through your body. It's just during part of the metabolic pathway. They never leave the enzyme because they are bad. Okay, but technically they are not naturally occurring. So where are they coming from? Whenever they, we can say we get trans fats from our diets, where are they coming from? It's through the through, through processing. They, they don't like to eat the, does anyone know what, what's the, the fancier term rather than saying, oh, this contains trans fats, like the way that they try to make it sound. No, no, no. Saturated means that there are no double bonds. So it means it's saturated with hydrogens. 
But have you ever like read like maybe maybe you sit at the breakfast table and you have nothing ever read to read, but you read like the margin or something and it says partially dehydrogenated, like that little term and they'll say oh it has partially dehydrogenated oils or partially dehydrogenated. That just means it's trans fat. Okay, so that's just the technical term because you know trans is such a trans fat. It's just it's calm. But no, they're they are they're really bad for you. And if you go on. Next semester in Organic Chemistry 2, we discuss a little bit more about trans fat, I mean, specifically about trans fats and why they're so bad. Biochemistry, we talk about them a lot, um, that kind of thing, especially in Biochem 2. But that's where trans fats, trans fats do contain trans double bonds, whereas the naturally occurring unsaturated fats, whether they're monounsaturated or polyunsaturated, which are the PUFAs, sometimes you see the PUF, especially if you're in the health fitness stuff, they'll say, oh, it's a PUFA. That just means polyunsaturated fatty acid. It means it's got multiple double bonds, and they are all cis. Okay. Just a little FYI. But they do. Their transtubutene has very different physical properties than cis-tubutene. And trans and cis are considered stereoisomers. It's just another type of stereoisomerism. All right. Um... All right, so what happens whenever we get to something like the following? So we've done it whenever there are two R groups and two hydrogens. But what if we need to do something like this? Let me just draw a couple. Now I've got to try to remember how to. <laughs> so there we go. All I did is I switched. And one of them, the bromine's going up. The next one, the bromine is on the one that's going out instead of up. These are stereoisomers of each other. But we can't use the term cis and trans because it has more than two things that are, have been um, substituted. Sometimes they call them substitutions. The, the hydrogen's been substituted by something else. So as long, if you have more than two things that, that, um, that are not hydrogens on the, on the double bonds, then you can't use cis or trans. Okay, so this goes back to the, what they call it, they call it the E and the Z or Z. Okay, configurations or comfort uh, or um, Sarah isomers. Okay, so what you do is just imagine that you take in either karate chop or your guillotine, whatever your form of violence your preference is, but the double bond on both of these. It's similar to when we were talking about stereoisomers and trying to do, do R versus S and give priority. But now what we're doing is we have to compare the things hanging off of the same carbon versus the things hanging off of the same carbon on the other side. So we're going to give one of them high priority and one of them low priority. The first... Once again, you go based off of its atomic mass or atomic number. Just like what, it's the same rules as what we did when we looked at R versus S. Okay? So if we look here, between the bromine and the methyl group, which one's going to be high priority? Is it going to be bromine or the carbon? It's the bromine. So that's the, that gets the H. And it's the same thing over here, H. And so this one's L, that one's L. Okay? Now we come to the other side of the karate chop, and we have an alcohol, and we have an ethyl group. Which one's going to get high priority there, the alcohol or the ethyl? The alcohol. And so it's high, this one's low, high, low. So now we can see 
that in this instance, we have the highs on opposite sides of the double bond. Whereas here we have the high groups on the same side of the double bond, meaning they're both pointing down, so to speak. In reality, you know, in three dimensions, it's moving around and stuff like that. But, um, but they're on the same side. So we still can't use cis and trans, because cis and trans is only for di-substituted um, alkenes. So they use, they go to German, the good old Germans. And if it's opposite, it's called an E. The E, and you know, you can't tell it, that E is in italics. And the E comes for the word antigagen, which is for opposite in German, antigagen. Whereas this is the Z or the Z. Once again, that's supposed to be in italics. In case you couldn't tell. And that's for German for the same, which is Zusammen. Okay, so once again, they're going to have different characteristics for E versus Z. <coughs> but you can do that with any of the alkenes. You don't have to worry about with alkynes, because alkynes only have one thing hanging off each side. You only have to do this with alkenes. All right. So this is just showing the exact same thing that we've been talking about. Cis versus trans, once again, it shows you how it's difficult to do the, converse, uh, the, the conversion between the two at normal temperatures and so on and so forth. Because they have to rotate and they would be banging into each other. But I wouldn't ask you that kind of question on the quiz or exam in class. And then once again, here's the EZ notational system. Right, and so you may want to look um, on your own and practice a couple of these. Um, and this is just pointing it out, which I want to just point out. This is they're really easy. Whenever it's a di substitute, it's really easy to tell if it's cis versus trans. The cis ones always kind of point either straight down or up, whereas the trans always looks like the little zigzags. Okay. But once again, once you get down to here, then you're gonna actually have to sit down and in fact, let's just practice doing one more. So it doesn't matter to me which we pick. Why don't we pick, I don't know, this one, this one looks complicated. So we probably chop it. I'll give you a moment to draw it. Okay, on this one, let's do the left-hand side of the guillotine. Which is going to get high priority? The methyl group, or this would be a hydrogen. Which one's going to be the high priority? The methyl. So that's high, low. Then if we come to the other side, which one's going to get high priority? Is it going to be what I'll call top? <laughs> or is it going to be the bottom that's going to get the high priority? Oh, we've got a disagreement. I know, it's like... This is an election period, so we get to vote. And let's face it, the choices we have here are much better than the choices we have right now for president. <laughs> okay. <laughs> so, not that I'm proselytizing here. One way or the other. Uh, we have top, we've got bottom. <laughs> so, so someone, who was it that said the bottom? I heard it. And I think I even know who it said it. So. <laughs> Come on, you gotta stand up for what you believe. Who wants to take the case for the bottom? Okay. <laughs> no one else would, so I'll be like. Yes. So why do you say that the bottom is top priority? Um, because it has more carbons and more hydrogens than. More carbons and more hydrogens? Mm -hmm. Is that what you said? Okay. Who wants to take the, the argument for the top and the top one having high priority? Now, someone said it. Oh, okay. Oxygen. Yes. So, remember when we were doing R and S? When we were doing R and S, how did we do that? How did we determine which one gets top priority? No, not necessarily the true negativity. I mean, it comes to atomic number, but what, what was it whenever we were going down the line? 
the first difference. Okay? So, when we come down on this one, whoops, sorry. There's the carbon. So the very first one we have is a C with two hydrogens on it, and this one's a C that's got three carbons. So now, between just looking at these two carbons here, which one's going to get high priority? The top or the bottom? It's the bottom. That's why I wanted to pick one that was kind of tricky. <laughs> but what's supposed to have more hydrogens? It's supposed to have more carbons. <laughs> and so, is this one going to be E or is it going to be Z? Is it Insignia or is it Because it's kind of fun to say that. It's Z or Z. Into Gagan and Zusamen, you know, they have, they, they can make it sound so powerful. Zusamen. Because they're on opposite sides. Oh, and it's E. Oh, see, I'm just, oh. oh. It's E. See, I'm just so, I just really wanted to say Zusamen. <laughs> no, it is E. E, and the way that I remember it, by the way, is E and opposite, both start with vowels, plus Zusamen, Z and, Z is, says Zane, I don't know. <laughs> Z and same both kind of have the same consonant. Uh, but yes. Good eye. You get a plus a half a point, metaphorical. <laughs> All right. There we go. Uh, I just want to point out here the fact, just like they, that you treat the naming and the locants just like you would with R and S. And it is possible to have both in the same name. So this is just what they're showing here. The way you can have, this is carbon number two is, first of all, the, the one with the double bond can never be chiral or, or it's always a chiral because it doesn't have four different things hanging off of it. But what they're trying to show here is we've got two R and this is two R, but it's three E because they're going on opposite sides. And then here we've got, <coughs> oh, I'm sorry about that. The two R, but it's three Z. <clears throat> Or you can also have it as an S versus the E, and so on and so forth. Okay. Um, physical properties, like I said, there. This one should make sense. Okay. I usually go blow through this part really fast because if you know alkanes, then you know alkenes. <clears throat> Okay. So essentially, when it comes to physical properties, alkenes act like alkanes. That's why. So that usually, if they have a low molecular weight, then they're going to have low boiling and melting points. Just think of propane. Propane's a gas at room temperature um, versus octane is a liquid. Well, propene would also be a, is a gas. Okay. There really isn't, if it's only carbons and hydrogens, there really isn't a, a dipole moment, okay? Now, once you start hetero, does anyone know what it means? What does, what does it mean when they say it's a hetero atom? Just different, it's a different, it's not a carbon, so it's different. Once you put those hetero atoms, you can have dipole moments, so it should make sense. You stick a chlorine on it and oxygen or something, then you're gonna create a dipole. So that's why I said there's nothing, Nothing new. <coughs> All right. So, um, I do want to point out something that's going to be important for later on. Oh, they're just letting you know that, yes, they're electron donating and all that kind of stuff. But I want to point this out. I'm going to move this up. Because this is important for the way that they do their chemistry. <clears throat> there is a type of resonance, if you want to think of it that way. Um, but they are electron rich. They can't be nucleophiles by themselves. But what we can see is later on that they can swing out and attack things at times. And we also see this hyperconjugation and induction. The hyperconjugation especially for the allylic systems that go double bond, single bond, double bond, single bond, those have special reactivities. So that's what this is trying to show here, is it is possible for the electrons here to come down and smack that carbon. So boom, because this is an allylic system. It goes single bond, double bond, 
single bond, okay? And so, because boom, something has to break or give, and what does is one of the bonds from the double bond can break. In doing it, it makes this act, it's not a major contributor, that's why it says it's minor, but it makes it act like it's negatively charged. Or it makes it more negatively charged than what you'd expect. More electron density than what you'd expect. It's not really a negative charge. And once again, that's a minor contributor. But it's a big enough player that it does make it possible for the double bonds to go out and attack things later on. So, for example, you can imagine, and there are th your body does this all the time with, with the ways that we do some of our fat, our lipid metabolisms and... And um, once you get to biochem 2, you'll see this over and over again. But what happens here is, I'm just going to borrow the, way, the one that they had, but this way I can draw it out. If we had some type of strong, or strong enough base or something, which a nucleophile, I'm just going to call it B, that can go and do the attacking what it would attack would be that, the was taking fruit would be that hydrogen. So it could come and attack the hydrogen. These electrons right here can go and do something. And what they can do is they're going to actually flow down just like what it showed there. So we have the, swiping the hydrogen. These electrons have to go somewhere. Boom. Sound effects optional. <clears throat> but something has to break or give. And what will break or give is one of the bonds. And it doesn't matter which one you choose. One of the bonds in the double bond can break. And what you could see is, I'm going to call it, just have a generic, oh, give me a different color. A generic electrophile. You know, that's delta plus or positive, possibly. If, I'm just going to call it electrophile. Something that can be a, attacked. Because <clears throat> then what happens is this bond can break and go out and swipe that E. <clears throat> and this, like I said, happens a lot in vivo. It's one way to add things across that double bond. So the resulting reaction, or resulting product, of course, you're going to have HB, but that one doesn't really matter. CH2, double bond, C, C. Now we've added a group to it. <clears throat> it's just one possibility. <coughs> I do mine this way. You don't have to. It's just the, the, the old guy that taught me organic chemistry one. That's the way that he did it to show you like a pivot. And it showed you like where the fulcrum, is it called the fulcrum? Is that right? From physics. It's been a long time since I had it. But where it would pivot from. Okay, and so that's like the little hinge. That's probably a better word for it in my vernacular. It hinges out and it grabs that E, that electrophile. In fact, it's called an electrophilic addition reaction, which you'll find out about later on. That's more of the things. All right, the very last thing that I want to talk about is relative stabilities. Because they're not all, not all alkenes are created equal. So we can imagine here we've got, oh, whoops, that's how I was drawing. That one versus one, two, three, four, five, one, two, three, four, five, this one. It's verses. They're supposed to be verses. And we can also have one, two, three, four, five verses. One, two, three, four, five. Okay. Okay. If everybody, I'm going to get caught up and just comparing the two groups. Or I should say the two within each group, within each color group. We're going to talk about which one is more stable than the other. <clears throat> so if we look at this very first one, we have one that's called a monosubstituted alkene. Because only one 
R group is hanging off, that then has three hydrogens. And this one's a di substituted, because there are two hydrogens, but two things have been other things other than hydrogen are hanging off. Which one, is it the one on the left or the one on the right that you think is gonna be more stable? In the sense that with heats of combustion. So we wanna venture a guess. It's the dye, because just like when we talked about carbocations and, and you'll find out with free radicals as well, the more friends that you have, the more stable you are. The same is true here. The more R groups you have hanging off, so just like if we had a tri, when they had three carbons hanging off, or four carbons even, then that's more stable. And more stable in the sense that you would have a, a, uh, a different, uh, there'd be a difference in the heats of combustion, okay? Now, here we've got, these are exactly the same. One, two, three, four, five. One, two, three, four, five. So it's two pentene. Is this trans or cis? Trans, and this one's cis. Um, which one do you think is going to be more stable in this sense? A trans or a cis? It's trans. And that's one of the reasons why it's so bad for your body. Your body, you, you, what you'll find out is it has really high melting points, and so it clogs your arteries and... Also, other bad things happen. It's not just your arteries that can clog. I've got a great video that I would show with cholesterol cystesters, cholesterol, cholesterol ester cysts, I should say, um, where it gets caught in someone's sinus cavity. And so you can get a, like these fatty cysts and things like that. It can go pretty much anywhere. Oh, but yes, once again, so I forgot to circle it. This one would be more stable than the other one, and then this one's more stable than the, than the other one. Okay.